uh, you find this notion of the higher man, a higher type of man uh, th than the ordinary person. And um, in, in Buddhism, you have the notion of the Arya or the uh, noble who reaches enlightenment or reaches uh, partial enlightenment. And in Confucianism, you have uh, the notion of the Chanzu or the superior man, or, or sometimes it's translated gentleman, but I think superior man or superior person is uh, a little better. And uh, just to say that in Confucianism, um, uh, the idea was that the individual will cultivate himself through uh, various arts, including uh, calligraphy, uh, mathematics, music, archery, charioteering, and uh, rites or ritual. And Freemasonry as well uh, talks to some extent, or at least mentions uh, the upright man or the upright man and Mason. And um, I'm sure that when you hear the term upright man, um, uh, some kind of image comes to you. And uh, before we move on and discuss this, I, I just want you to, uh, I just want to ask you to just think about what does come to your mind when you hear the term upright man? And what does it mean to you? Um, I'm sure that no matter what, you may envision him as standing or seating, but you don't envision him as slouching. Uh, the chances are, I suspect, that he looks a lot like you. He probably has the same kind of bone structure, same kind of facial features, similar hair color, and so on. I think he's probably doesn't appear eager to please, but instead embodies in his expression uh, nobility and uh, fortitude, strength, honor, and uh, other values that uh, the modern world may have some issues with. Um, I suspect as well that when you think of the upright man, his physical body is a lot like yours as well, although probably slightly improved, perhaps less skinny or less overweight and a little stronger. And I say this as an artist, by the way, so when you paint, and you paint uh, uh, figures from your mind, for example, they always end up looking a little bit like you. So I'm sure that this is the case with uh, when we think of the upright man as well. Uh, and I want you to think about that image, or at least keep that in your mind as we move forward. Uh, I mentioned that Confucianism teaches the arts of war and the arts of peace, such as archery, charioteering, music, and mathematics. And we find this in other cultures as well. This is a very, <clears throat> very standard uh, education for the superior type of uh, man. So if you look at, uh, if you look at um, for example, Japanese culture, uh, you find someone like uh, Miyamoto Masashi, the samurai, uh, of course, he was renowned for his uh, martial prowess and being undefeated in battle. But he's also known in Japan for his uh, painting and his calligraphy. And at the time of his life, he was also known for garden design as well. Which uh, may strike us as a little bit strange that you have a warrior who's renowned for these things. But, the, but this, um, this mix of uh, the hard and the soft arts, the arts of peace and the arts of war, can be found uh, across the globe and even in uh, European culture before and after Christianity. And perhaps one uh, good example is the 10th century uh, Viking, uh, Egil Skala Grimson. Uh, he made his first kill at the age of seven. Uh, not a particularly nice fellow, but he was also renowned in his lifetime uh, for his poetry as well. And uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a slight subtle reflection of this uh, mindset in Freemasonry. So although the symbol of Freemasonry is based very much on geometry and stonemasonry, uh, the building of Solomon's temple, and, and so on and so forth, uh, we also find the emblem of the sword, the sword pointed at the heart, the sword protecting the sacred volume, uh, the volume of sacred law, and also the uh, sword uh, outside of the uh, outer door of the lodge. And yet, the Freemason is encouraged to uh, learn the several, seven liberal arts. I'm not sure how many Freemasons would do that, but the, the symbolism of the, the sword and the liberal arts, which are grammar, dialectic, rhetoric, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music, is a similar kind of mix that you find in Confucianism and uh, elsewhere. So why the sword? Well, long before the emergence of Freemasonry, uh, gentlemen were expected to learn uh, sword fighting. Uh, about a decade before the uh, Grand Lodge of Freemasonry, uh, the, the 
Grand Lodge of Freemasonry in London, was established around 1707. Uh, William Hope, who was the uh, governor of, uh, deputy governor of Edinburgh Castle, actually reformulated the idea of, um, of sword fighting. It's not directly relevant to Freemasonry, of course, but uh, he, uh, he de-emphasized the idea of fighting duels and kill, killing people who may have upset your honor to making it more of a, a defensive or self-defensive art that you protect yourself against uh, criminals and so on. Um, because the, the sword was a mark of a gentleman, uh, later in some French jurisdictions, uh, lodges actually adopted the wearing of swords uh, regardless of the rank of the, uh, the brothers present. Mm -hmm. So whether they were gentlemen or not, they would wear swords. And uh, this, of course, illustrated that they were on the level. But um, I think it should be said that it doesn't just illustrate that they're on the level, but they're also uh, the superior type of man, the gentleman. They've stepped up, and, and that's what it's essentially signifying. Notice that uh, the lodge didn't take off the swords and lower themselves down, but they brought everyone up instead. Uh, we've already noticed the, uh, the, the practice of the arts of war and peace. And I just wanted to mention that uh, William, uh, William D. Moore, uh, in his book Masonic Temples, says something similar, although it's formulated in a slightly different way. Uh, he compares the Blue Lodge to uh, the archetype, or as he would call it, the male archetype of the craftsman. And he compares the uh, order of the temple to the male archetype of the warrior and the Scottish rite to the male archetype of the uh, mystic. Um, I think this is slightly uh, simplistic because if you go back uh, to at least considerably uh, in time, uh, you find that these are not entirely distinct. So if you go back into primitive cultures and primitive tribes and ancient culture, you find, for example, that the uh, blacksmith uh, actually, in, in many cases, had a role very similar to the shaman and was able to participate and lead certain uh, tribal rites. And uh, even if you look at the symbolism or the mythology of someone like uh, Thor, uh, you clearly see that he's a kind of blacksmith god. Sparks come from his beard, which is red. His hammer glows red hot and has to be held with a, uh, an iron gauntlet. And one of his wives is called Jan Saxa, which essentially means iron stone. So there's this kind of curious sort of mysticism uh, built into um, some early crafts. Um, and of course, uh, uh, the first type of metallurgy, incidentally, uh, they didn't use um, melting. It used, uh, it used metals uh, rather like stones so that would be chipped away, which would be a primitive meteoric iron or something like that. And um, Again, with the, uh, the warrior, you also see elements of, uh, of mysticism as well with someone like Miyamoto Musashi, who went and meditated in a cave for 12 years. Uh, Zen has become very much a part of the, the martial arts uh, in the past, maybe less now. But you see this uh, across the globe. Even in Europe, you have the, uh, uh, of the Norse uh, people, you have the berserker class, who were the feared warriors, but... Um, also seem to have been involved in some kind of cultic rites and possibly in taking some kind of hallucinogens and were uh, dedicated to the god Odin. Um, but modernity is not like the pre-modern world. And um, I think a good, a good way of expressing this is actually what uh, the Polish uh, sociologist and philosopher uh, Zygmunt Bauman calls uh, liquid modernity. So if you look at the Enlightenment, it was the idea that we could sh uh, shake off the oppression of religion and all of these uh, institutions that limited our thinking, and then we would become free enough to realize the truth, and we would all essentially think uh, similar, but the rational mind would be able to comprehend uh, the truth. So we ourselves become the ultimate uh, guide of what is real. But we're beyond that now, and we live in an age where uh, even sort of facts do not seem to matter very much. So the age of liquid modernity is an age in a way of meaningless or floating meaning or changing meaning. It means this one day, but the next day it means something completely different. And it's the, the, the age of um, liquid assets, you could say, of market liquidity, gender fluidity, and of an immense social pressure to go with the flow.
but we don't exactly know where we're going. And I want to ask, in essence, uh, what does it mean to be an initiate in this kind of day and age? Um, and I'm going to look at a few different elements of Freemasonry to kind of illustrate uh, how different it is to our comprehension of, uh, of the world today. And the, the elements I want to look at are the, the body, uh, values, and of those values in particular, justice and proportion. And lastly, I want to look at death. So beginning with the body, um, much misunderstood by the outside world, and I, I think it's true to say not frequently commented upon by Freemasons, we find that the initiate exposes uh, the extremities when he goes through the ritual, meaning the, uh, the arms, uh, the feet, and if you think it's significant that the master wears a hat, then also his head. Um, and I, I've compared this to um, the five points of the pentagram. If you look at uh, the three books of occult philosophy by Cornelius Agrippa, which Greg mentioned earlier on, uh, you find in there a figure of uh, a, a male figure with his extremities outstretched, he's naked, and he's in, inside a pentagram, so each of the extremities uh, reaches or uh, coordinates with one of the uh, points of the pentagram. And I'm not trying to convince you that um, Freemasonry comes from the occult. That's actually not, um, not my uh, comprehension of things at all. But um, we should acknowledge that magic or occultism, as it might be called now, was at one point another branch of knowledge and considered reasonably respectable. But um, what's significant about the uh, comparison of the body to the, the five points of the pentagram is that uh, the, the, in, in geometry, the pentagram was seen to represent the uh, golden mean or the golden ratio, which is supposedly found throughout architecture and is allegedly found throughout nature. So if you examine the uh, veins of a leaf, you can discern the same sort of geometry. Um, and what that means essentially is that when you realize that you're, in a sense, peering into the mind of God, uh, you've discovered the sort of essence that, be that is behind it. It's no longer a just a man, it's also uh, geometry, and if the, if the creator really is a great architect and he creates, in, uh, creates through geometry or geometrically, then uh, man is a sense uh, the thought of God, and we're peering into the mind of God, and it's embodied in us and it's embodied in nature as well. And um, I've noticed on, on many old uh, tracing boards or floor cloths and uh, old artifacts and aprons, that the, the pentagram seems to be represented much more, say, in the 18th century than it is today. And I suspect that it was uh, one of the emblems that was drawn on the floor uh, when lodges met in taverns and they drew out uh, diagrams on the floor in chalk or possibly in chalk and charcoal. And even today, of course, in many lodges, we see a pentagram or five-pointed star uh, in the lodge, usually in mosaic. So my point really is, um, oh, I should just mention as well, that another interpretation of the pentagram, uh, in Neoplatonism, uh, the pentagram was regarded as a secret symbol of recognition among the Pythagoreans and uh, was uh, meant to represent health. And I think in a way that it's saying the same thing in a different way. If you have health, you must be in tune with nature, and nature is itself in tune with God, which created it. Um, so there's a sort of link between the, the physical body and the mind of God and God as the creator. Uh, we think today of our, as our, of our body as a temple. Uh, we go within, especially when we meditate or pray, and we shut out the outside world and all of the violence and the horrible things that we don't like, and we're going within our temple. But uh, I want to suggest something different, and it may be a little controversial, but I want to suggest that the body can be understood as a kind of talisman, and it's essentially radiating an idea, which is the character of the person, but in a certain sense of the initiate who is in some way linked to deity, is it radiating this archetypal power of the connection between man and God in a physical 
uh, physical form. So if we think of the, the term upright man, I think you get a hint of that. And if you look at what the term upright means, uh, it means uh, three things according to the dictionary. It means strong moral behavior, uh, to stand erect, and something that's perpendicular. And I think what we notice about that is these three meanings are actually very Masonic in a way. So you have strong moral character, uh, perpendicular, which is geometry, and to stand erect. And this is essentially what I mean by the body as a talisman. It's to some degree geometric, but even if that wasn't the case, the body is representing uh, the character, the morals, the values of the person. And if we believe we are created by God, ultimately our physical selves are also radiating uh, this um, connection between us and God and us as a part of the creation, us as a part of the mind of God or as a thought of God. So let me move on to uh, values. Uh, it's, it's an uncomfortable fact, but uh, we do, our values are not the values of modernity. I know that there will be some people who disagree with that. I meet many spiritual people whose values are in essence whatever the, uh, the values of the day are. And what they are today, they will change tomorrow and they weren't yesterday. But their values are always what is on the vogue. Um, I, I, a few months ago, for example, as a good illustration of this, and a very harmless comment, but I was talking to um, a young brother I don't think he'd been a Freemason that long. And we were just talking, and he, in, the, in the course of the conversation, he said that, that Freemasons believe in equality. And, uh, and I said to him that we believe we're on the level. Now, that might be a controversial thing to say for some people, but um, you know, why didn't I really just agree? Because many people, including many Freemasons, would say, well, being on the level means equality. And there are a couple of reasons why... I, 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 I don't know if I corrected him, but I you know, gave my opinion at least. And that is, and that is uh, words change their meaning. And what words mean today, they didn't yesterday, and they certainly won't tomorrow. But political or politicized meanings change extremely rapidly. And sometimes they change week by week, uh, depending on the circumstances and you know, who is involved in the circumstances and this kind of thing. And sometimes they reverse themselves. It's very complicated. But... Um, I don't think that that's the kind of thing that we can subscribe to. But there's a, a more important reason uh, why I say that we are on the level. And th to put it succinctly, I would say that we are on the level because we are on the same journey. And we're not on the level down here. We're on the level up here. So you may recall that I mentioned uh, some French lodges wearing swords when they could have just taken, the gentlemen of the lodge could have taken their swords off. So they didn't say, we're going to be on the level down here. They said, we're going to all step up. We're all gentlemen. We're all on the same journey. So we're all going to wear swords because that's what the sword represented at that time. So where do our values come from? Well, in the most literal sense, if you walk into a, a Masonic lodge, if there's a ritual going on, Obviously, yeah, you would see a uh, volume of the sacred law on the altar. For Christians, of course, this is the Bible. Uh, for Muslims, this is the Quran. For Hindus, this might be the Vedas or the Bhagavad Gita. Um, we know that there's a range of, um, of holy books and religions out there. But I think, uh, in a, maybe even in a more real sense, our values um, are embodied in and to some extent come from the Masonic emblems, um, the, the compasses in the circle, the level, the setting mall, the rough and perfect ashlars. All of these illustrate the values of Freemasonry. But I would also say that they prove the values of Freemasonry. So for instance, um, the idea of being on the level, you could say it's illustrated by the, the stonemason's tool, the level, or the geometry of a horizontal line, let's say. But I think that another way of looking at it is that those things actually prove that that value exists. Uh, a less abstract example would, the bee, would be the beehive. So we don't need to know what Freemasonry says about the beehive. 
to understand that it's saying something, and maybe something more than the, uh, the lecture actually says. And that is, if you look at it, it's a colony uh, of workers that are working together to create this structure, uh, which is a geometric structure of uh, hexagonal cells. <clears throat> in other words, you could say that the beehive in nature exemplifies the large. And you could say that the lodge reflects uh, this thing in nature, which is the beehive. So in other words, it's not, um, it's not a kind of subjective thing. It's already out there in the world. And if, again, if we believe that the world or uh, nature was created by God as the great architect, um, he has em embodied in the world these specific values. So when we look at something in nature, we don't just see an object. We also see some kind of value or some kind of thought so of the, of the values that I specifically want to look at, uh, it's uh, justice and proportion. So in the Masonic ritual, uh, we find several fleeting references to justice. Uh, the most succinct uh, one is perhaps in the textbook of Freemasonry, uh, which was published in 1870, uh, where the master tells the apprentice to uh, let justice be the guide of all your actions. And it may seem kind of curious that justice should be the guide of all our actions because we think of justice as being the responsibility of police and the judiciary. But uh, if you look at, say, David Hume, the 18th century philosopher, uh, he, in a sense, concurs and says that of all values or of all qualities, justice uh, goes further than any other in fixing the character. And I have suggested that our values are to be found out in the world, physically embodied, either in nature or in geometry. And when we think of justice, we tend to think of the balance or the scales. And to a certain extent, that definitely works. But there's another way of looking at justice, and that is proportion. So if somebody steals a loaf of bread and is given 10 years in prison, and someone else commits murder and is given a week in prison, we would say that both of those uh, sentences are unjust because one is proportionately much higher than the crime and one is proportionately much lower than the crime. And proportion then is essential to justice, but proportion is also essential to geometry. Um, if you look at Merriam-Webster's uh, dictionary definition of um, of proportion, she says that it is, quote, the relation of one part to another or to the whole with respect to magnitude, quantity, or degree, unquote. And this can be crime to punishment. It can be, say, a good deed or a positive action to a reward. <clears throat> it can be the relationship of uh, one side of a triangle to the other two. And it can be the, the relationship of our actions uh, and commitments within our life in general. Uh, notice, notice as well that even in Freemasonry, we're only bound to attend the lodge if it's quote unquote within the length of our cable toe. In other words, even attending lodge is supposed to be proportionate uh, to the rest of our lives and the commitments in the rest of our lives. Uh, Freemasonry can't be, or going to lodge can't be 90% of my life. Uh, that's out of proportion. And proportion shows up in other ways in Freemasonry. And I think the most obvious example is the 24-inch uh, gauge, which represents the 24 hours of the day. Uh, notice that it's not 24 hours for one thing, but it's supposed to be divided into eight hours for work, eight hours for God, and eight hours for rest and recreation. But whether it's really possible to dedicate eight hours for us today uh, to God, I think that's open to, to, to debate. But I think we don't really have to be quite so literal. We can understand that the idea is that the, the day is broken up or our lives are broken up proportionately uh, into the practical, into the spiritual, and even into uh, health with uh, rest. So lastly, I want to look at death. So anyone that has uh, gone through the Masonic ritual, or for those who have not gone through the Masonic ritual, anyone that has seen um, Masonic artifacts, especially from the 18th and 19th century, will know that death is a significant, uh, a significant symbol or significant theme within Freemasonry. So if you look at a lot of um, antique uh, Masonic regalia, aprons, 
Uh, you find sometimes the coffin on it, the skull and crossbones, a scythe, and even the uh, Latin term memento mori, meaning remember death. And again, if you look at uh, uh, tracing boards, which are typically uh, a British phenomenon, um, for those who don't know, a tracing board is a, usually a painting uh, with the Masonic emblems on it, which are relevant to a specific degree. So there's one for the entered apprentice, one for the fellow craft, uh, one for the uh, master mason. And if you look at the uh, tracing boards, you, again, you find uh, uh, the emblem of death is very significant. Uh, the third degree tracing board, which you can find online or in books, uh, is very often little more than a coffin, sometimes with a corpse inside it. Sometimes, if that's not clear enough, it has a skull and crossbones on top. So it's a, it's a kind of big deal. Um, today, of course, like everything else, our relationship to death has changed. And in some respects, for the, for the better. So if we went back to a few hundred years ago, uh, infant mortality was not only uh, normal, but was often high, and often in, it's in some years, um, if the weather was bad, infant mortality could be extremely high, and virtually all newborn babies could die. And people had uh, multiple children, you know, usually around, say, eight to ten children, not just because there were no contraceptives, but because uh, very often half of the children were going to die before they reached adulthood. So death was everywhere. And death was a part of daily life. And of course, people didn't die in hospital where we can't see them. They died at home. The grandparents died at home. Children died at home. So even before you've got out of childhood, you would know the reality of death because it was going to be in your home. And if it wasn't miraculously in your home, it was going to be in your neighbor's home. It was a real serious business. Um, today, however, that's not the case. Obviously, when, when people do die, nine times out of ten, it's in hospital. We don't see it. If our neighbors die, we're not going to see it. But strangely enough, although it has been pushed out of our lives as something serious and something real, it's come back almost like a kind of, um, like a kind of neuroses and is absolutely everywhere. So according to the American Psychologist Association, uh, a child who watches two hours of television a day will have seen 8,000 murders by the time they leave um, elementary school. Now, of course, many of those will be cartoons, but it seems to me that we're fixated on death. I mean, if you go home and turn the TV on, the chances are it's a drama, and the theme revolves around murder or some kind of truly horrific murder, and you know, we need not go into details. But, it's not taken seriously. It's true, of course, that we do see death on the news, and that is real. But like our moral outrage, what we are shown is very often selective. So we are currently outraged by the death of children in Syria, but we don't care about the death of children in Yemen. Not an entirely different country, really, when you think about it, or an entirely different culture. And according to UNICEF, for example, um, one child dies in Yemen as a result of the war there every 10 minutes. And more than 450,000 children are at risk of starvation in Yemen. I'm not making any kind of moral point, I'm not making any kind of political point, but I'm just making the point that we can be extremely selective when it comes even to death. We're morally outraged and marching in the street about this war, but this war over there we haven't even noticed. And again, I would say that this comes back to proportion. I would say also that the, the mature civilization, and for that matter, the higher type of man, the initiate of some spiritual tradition or even a religious tradition, is very much aware, very much cognizant of death. So even leaving aside the uh, symbolism of the Masonic ritual proper, uh, and I saw some evidence of this last night, in uh, some European jurisdictions and in some Masonic lodges in America even, uh, there is a chamber of reflection. And the candidate prior to taking the initiation uh, will be asked to sit in at this chamber of reflection, often has black walls, 
There's usually a table with a skull and crossbones on it. Sometimes there are some uh, symbols of mortality and other symbols on the wall. And the candidate for initiation will be asked to um, reflect upon his mortality. In some jurisdictions, he's asked to write out his will. So he's been asked to imagine that he might be about to die. Now, I doubt any candidate actually thinks he's going to die. It's not a kind of hazing, right? And I think that a lot of times the people who don't understand initiation think the, these things are kind of hazing. So if you show your ankles, that's hazing. Or if you're made to think about death, that's hazing. But the point of um, thinking about death is actually to elevate the consciousness. So in some jurisdictions, we also find various um, statements written on the wall. <clears throat> and I think the most telling of which is, uh, if you want to live well, think of death. So obviously, the candidate is not being intimidated. He's actually being asked to think about his mortality, how long he's got to live, and so on. Uh, for many, of course, this is a frightening idea. <clears throat> and I'm not criticizing Christians when I say this, but I happened to be listening to um, a Christian radio show once. And uh, it was about the evils of Freemasonry, of course. And um, the, the, Christian, the Christian perspective was that he said it was truly terrible because of all these macabre symbols of death and horror and all this kind of thing. And I couldn't help but think to myself, I wonder if he's been to church lately. Because if he had gone to church, he would notice that the baby Jesus is not the focal point of the church. It's the crucifixion. And what could honestly be a more terrifying image than the Son of God being crucified? It's not meant to be pleasant. Life isn't a joke. It's not a laugh. And pre-modern cultures and initiation and religions where they still take themselves seriously understand that death and understanding mortality, it's, um, that should be a, a focal point, really. It's not to, not to feel morbid about it at all, but as the, uh, one of the statements on the Chamber of Reflection says, as I mentioned, if you want to live well, think of death. And uh, the church is not unusual, of course. We find this in all traditions, or uh, all traditions that I'm aware of. Uh, Hindu chantrikas, for example, uh, they often meditated in graveyards, uh, which were not like ours. This, this, this is meditating amongst the, the scattered remains of corpses. Uh, there's a Buddhist meditation where you meditate on the breathing, then on the elements of the body, and then finally on the death of your own body and its decay. And again, if you, if you look at the, uh, the late samurai text, the Hagakura, uh, it states, uh, the, way of the way of the samurai is found in death. Meditation on inevitable death should be performed daily. Now, in case you're not entirely convinced by this, I just want to read a quote from Steve Jobs, uh, the founder of Apple. I don't hold him as some great guru, but he is someone who is uh, respected by the modern world and maybe even fetishized by the modern world a little bit. But here's what uh, Steve Jobs has to say on death. Uh, quote, remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life. Because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, <clears throat> these things fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important, unquote. And uh, not to bombard you with uh, quotes about death, <clears throat> but I'll just leave you with this one quote on the subject. And this is from the uh, medieval Icelandic text, the Poetic Edda. Cattle die and kinsmen die, and so one dies oneself. But, I know, but a noble name will never die if good renown one gets. So it seems to agree with Steve Jobs that if you want to live a decent life, a good life, if you really want to actualize yourself and be the best you can be, you need to be um, aware of your mortality, and that's something you should be thinking of. And of course, I think probably with traditional cultures, thinking of your mortality was also thinking about your children, your grandchildren, your tribe, and what's going to live on way after you as well, of course. Um, lastly, I want to say this about mortality. Uh, many spiritual people think of death and mortality as purely symbolic, that death represents the transformation of the individual that has gone through initiation, and it's symbolic of the death of the old self. But I think uh, when you think about the examples I've given, the Hindu Tantrika, the Samurai, Steve Jobs, Christianity, 
Um, what we find is actually that death is considered to be completely real and not, not taken in, in a sense of symbolic. Yes, it can be symbolic, but the whole point is to think about it as something that is real and, and uh, inevitable for us. And I would, I would suggest, in fact, that that is the real purpose of initiation. The real purpose of initiation is not to uh, give us symbols to interpret from our own personal experiences, uh, because that is something we do with everything, regardless of whether it's spiritual or not. Any information you get, you're going to interpret according to your understanding. The real purpose of initiation is to show us that the world is real, that life is larger than life and includes even death. That the things around us, that nature, that our body, it's not just material stuff. It represents, it is the embodiment of the thoughts of God. The natural world embodies the supernatural, the divine. Things are more three-dimensional than they appear, more real than they appear. So in contrast to a lot of modern spirituality, which is about, well, this is my opinion, I'm going to interpret it the way I like, I only like these three passages from this holy book, I'm going to mix it with the ones I like from that holy book, that's not the point. The point is to see, see and experience the world as even more real than it seemed to be before initiation, more three-dimensional, more multicolored, more depth, more real. And that, to me, is the real purpose of initiation. So I asked you at the beginning to just think about your image of the upright man. And I just I will ask you to recall that now. Uh, we often hear complaints uh, from Freemasons that the regalia and the officer's staffs and the furniture of the lodge is tattered, it's looking old, it's worn. It needs to be washed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, I totally agree that lodges uh, should look good and that things should be uh, in good condition. But more important than the condition of the regalia are the Freemasons that are wearing it. Uh, think of the upright man, your image of the upright man, not mine. Isn't it true that that is the kind of man? that you wanted to meet when you joined Freemasonry, and the kind of man that you wanted to become when you joined Freemasonry. And I would suggest that that image, which is your image, not mine, that image is a kind of talisman to you, telling you what you can become, and that is well within your grasp. I know this is unusual, but I just want to leave you with a few words of advice or suggestions. Uh, one, hold yourself upright. Be conscious of your thoughts and be conscious of your posture. Two, remember proportion. And I really think that this is maybe the most important thing that we can do today. I would suggest that when you hear something said about, say, Islam or Christianity or Republicans or Democrats or men or women, just ask yourself, the way I feel now when I hear that, or my reaction to that, or what I want to say, would I say it if it were the opposite? So when you hear something about, say, Islam, you can ask yourself, would I feel this way? Would I react this way if it were said about Christianity? And you should do that for the political sides and for, the, uh, for men and women and all kinds of things that you might feel drawn into in not a very good way. And that is about consistency, and consistency is about proportion. And if you do that, if you're consistent and you check yourself, you won't be drawn into values that are always changing, but instead you'll remember your own values, which are your higher values, and you'll remember your higher self or the upright man. Uh, three, remember mortality. Remember what, will, what is important to you. Remember, try to think about what you will be thinking about at the moment of death. That's what's important to you during life. So try and cultivate that and cut out what is negative to it. And fourth and lastly, no matter where we, each of us may be on the journey, we're all a talisman, a beacon, a beacon of light to someone else in Freemasonry or outside of Freemasonry. And I believe that we have to give what we have and share what we know.
and share our experiences and our wisdom, no matter how limited that might be for any of us. We all have something that we can share. I know some things, you know other things, and we need to try and bring each other up. And I would encourage you to share your knowledge and your wisdom and your experiences with younger men, with your brothers in large, so that we can all bring each other up together to this, uh, this idea of the upright man or the higher man. Thanks very much.